My name is Matt Perez. Today I'm interviewing Matt Parker. Society 2445 Friday Talks are interviews with people from around the world seeking to create a new future through a social movement and thought leadership. We aim to bring together disparate movements from across various disciplines to help co-create a broader and more cohesive vision for the year 2045. We have vision of what it could be, but we want to know yours. By bringing together adjacent movements and thought leaders, we believe we can create a stronger, wider voice for change. And uh, thank you for your interest in, in, in being part of this. Uh, Matt, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, so my name's Matt Parker. I'm the author of an upcoming book called A Radical Enterprise, um, Pioneering the Future of High-Performing Organizations, and uh, it's publishing in February of next year. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm, I've been in software for a long time. My dad was a programmer, and my dad's dad was a programmer, and so I've been around computers since I was a little kid, and yeah, just sort of immersed in that world, and um, you know, studied things like computer science in college, have been in programming for a long time. I, I had a lot of, I would say my first decade of experience in the work, working world was sort of miserable. I worked for both small and large corporations and uh, none of it was a very good experience and caused me to question, should I even stick around in this industry at all? And, and then I found my way to a company called Pivotal Labs. And at the time, in those early days of Pivotal Labs, it was um, it was very radically collaborative. There were no bosses. There were, you know, it was all these self-managing teams working with clients, us just all kind of geeking out together and trying to do what we could to help our clients build great software and using practices like pair programming and test driven development while doing it. So some really radically collaborative practices while doing it and having a lot of fun. Now, Pivotal Labs became part of a larger company that eventually became called Pivotal. And it sort of had this slow march towards large enterprise hierarchy. And I spent a better part of a decade there, though, and, and I'm still thankful for all my experiences there. And it, it inspired me to try and find companies out there that had somehow bucked this trend towards uh, you know, all the problems that I had faced anyways in the working world. And that led me to research organizations like Nearsoft, for example. And I reached out to uh, Matt and Roberto and uh, had great conversations. And they put me in contact with a lot of awesome people at Nearsoft, now in Quora, and um, uh, also uh, organizations like Hire, other software organizations like C Labs and um, Tim Group and Alpha Humantis, and all kinds of great companies that had really taken a very different approach to both building and scaling their organization. And I tried to understand how they worked, why they worked, and um, what's sort of necessary for not only being a radically collaborative organization, but also succeeding at it and sustaining it over time. And so I ended up at these sort of four imperatives that I talk about in the book, team autonomy, managerial devolution, uh, deficiency gratification, and candid vulnerability. And so, yeah, so anyways, I've been on this journey for a while, and um, I'm excited to see this book come out um, and to have conversations like this with people about the work they're doing to learn from all of you, too. Yeah, I'll, I'll just start there. Pivotal was an early era, early influence on me hmm. um, in that they adopted, they were very vocal about extreme programming, which was yeah. the term at the time, and, um, and they actually practice it. And, um, they weren't that far from us either. I was at some microsystem at the time and mm. they were literally, literally down the street. And um, so it was, it was a really good company. I, I have to agree with you in the first so many years, I don't know how many. Mm. And then, as you said, it got sold and got sucked into a hierarchy. Yeah. Um, so one, one of the things that you, you treat in your book is this four principles and mm. that's I've uh, gotten a lot of attention from the people that I talk to, um, but they're not all very clear. I know that if you read the whole book and it, it flows naturally, and it does. It, was, it, was, it, it is a well-written book. 
But um, for the sake of, of the people watching this, why don't you explain what the four principles are and what they really mean and uh, maybe cite some examples or whatever. What yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so the four, uh, I call them imperatives in the book. Um, uh, the reason I use that term, by the way, is because they, I, as far as I can tell, I, I, I believe that they are imperative for organizations to sustain a radically collaborative uh, structure and environment um, and to succeed at it over a long period of time. And that's really just me trying to synthesize what I can from learning about and researching all these different organizations and doing interviews with people and seeing how they work. Uh, what's sort of the underlying secret to their success. And so I came up with four things. Uh, and uh, one is simply something I noticed in all these organizations. There is a great deal of team autonomy within these organizations and individual autonomy too, but even perhaps a greater emphasis on collaborative team autonomy. And that sort of boiled down to uh, six different dimensions of autonomy, autonomy of how, um, so how are people working together? What practices are they using? For instance, if they're building software, are they doing things like pairing and test-driven development or other stuff? Really, a lot of that is left up to the teams to figure out and own. Uh, autonomy of uh, schedule is something I saw in a lot of these companies too, in which you know, there was no sort of nine to five dictate from on high. Uh, uh, teams and individuals were creating their own schedules and also deciding whether they're co-located or distributed, remote, asynchronous, synchronous, all that kind of stuff. Um, autonomy of role is also something I saw in a lot of these companies. So people, uh, I, many people are hired into these companies with a specific idea of something they'll be doing, but they also seem to have a lot of um, freedom to explore new roles. And this is really uh, closely related to autonomy of allocation within these companies. So the actual like teams that people are gravitating to uh, is very much left up to individuals to figure out, like, what am I really passionate about? And so many of these corporations, they have a sense of autonomy of allocation. Um, and, you know, this was one of the first things that stood out to me about these companies. And it's also sort of something that I knew there had to be more to it because those things on their own just sort of, I mean, on the one hand, I loved every, every bit of it, but on the other hand, I thought, if that's all there is, how does this not just evolve into chaos? Right, like who who does the hard work that no one wants to do, right? Like, you know, it, it all sounds great, but who cleans the toilets is basically, you know, a way to put it. And so I realized that there had to be more to it than that. Um, and that's what led me to discover these three other imperatives. So one of them I call managerial devolution. Devolution is simply a technical term for the decentralization of power out of the hands of a static dominator hierarchy and into a, the hands of sort of a self-organizing hierarchy. And so there are all kinds of fascinating sort of ways that these companies have devolved um, power into the organization at large and in turn made themselves more power. So not diluting power within the organization, but in some ways becoming much more powerful and much more nimble and much more agile and able to respond. So these could be anything from things like the advice process to leadership teams at Nearsoft to um, holocratic governance at um, places like C-Labs and VZ and others. So um, all kinds of different ways that they have figured out, like how do we create an organization which can evolve rapidly, which doesn't require some kind of person at the top, you know, pulling strings and being some kind of puppet master. And I think it makes these organizations so much more capable of responding to change and evolution, but also coordinating at scale, right? And keeping things like the, the level of team autonomy from devolving into chaos, right? It's these higher level, uh, forms of managerial devolution that enable autonomy uh, to scale within the organization. So then the third thing I discovered too is that these organizations, the people inside of them, they're just so much happier than most of us are in most enterprises and corporations around the world. They feel a greater sense of security and autonomy and fairness and esteem and respect and trust and belongingness. Like, all these different dimensions. Um, they seem to be getting so much more out of their experiences inside these corporations than I think most of us do inside you know, less radically collaborative organizations. And so that's what I call the third imperative, deficiency gratification. 
That's again, that's actually a shortening of a slightly a longer term called efficiency need gratification. Um, and that really comes from the field of positive psychology. Deficiency needs are the needs that all of us are born with. They're inborn, they're instinctoid, but they're also something that we need from our environment. We can't feel secure. We can't have a sense of autonomy and fairness and esteem in our lives without the, um, without the cooperation of the people around us, right? It's something we get from other people and can't get on our own. And so I, I discovered that all these, uh, most of these organizations seem to have very, not only high levels of deficiency gratification, but a number of practices for enabling it um, uh, that you see in these organizations, both really small things that they do like on a daily basis. This could be like balance scores, which is something you can see at Civic Actions that I talk about in the book where people begin every meeting by saying a score between one to 10 about how balanced they feel in the moment between their work life, home life, spiritual life, whatever. How are they managing their priorities? They communicate that to each other on a daily basis with the people they're collaborating with. Um, and it could be very big things, like for instance, a coin ceremony, challenge coin ceremony in which people uh, recognize each other on an annual basis for their being, not for the work that they're doing, but for the being that they are and what they're bringing um, to the world and to each other. Lastly, the fourth imperative is called candid vulnerability. Now that's my terminology that I use in the book because I believe it's, um, uh, probably much more evocative and words that we normally hear as opposed to a technical term for it that you can read about in sociology called model to reasoning or model to productive reasoning. Uh, researchers like Chris Ardra sort of pioneered this sort of field of sociology that looked at the way um, the, the sort of behaviors that people exhibit inside organizations uh, and the underlying sort of routines that people have that lead them, lead them to exhibit those behaviors. So most people exhibit something called model one defensive reasoning. It's based on maintaining unilateral control, um, winning and not losing, suppressing negative emotions in themselves and in other people, and also being rational, quote unquote. So a lot of people exhibit a lot of really dysfunctional behavior based on these four sort of tacit and unconscious routines that they have learned from a very early age from people around them and from society. But there is another type of reasoning out there called model two productive reasoning. It's very rare. Um, and I call it candid vulnerability because I think that drives to the heart of what it is. It's a way of reasoning in which people, when they're collaborating with others, not only say what they think, they don't shy away from saying what they think, even if it's going to upset somebody, but they make themselves vulnerable too. They say why they think it. What is this sort of hidden chain of beliefs and assumptions and biases and everything that leads them to, to think what they think. So they make that stuff vulnerable and make it open to examination, critique and validation. And this becomes a way for groups to actually innovate collectively. Um, because instead of everyone sort of fighting for an idea and defending it from others, they're sharing ideas and collectively evolving them together. And it's, it sort of untethers the idea from the ego. Um, and so I saw a great deal of this going on in these organizations and as well as some practices for doing it. Um, and, and also some ways of even learning it inside these organizations and practicing it. Those are the four imperatives. And that's what I spent a lot of time in the book sort of trying to uh, get into and um, illustrate through stories and also sort of research. Yeah, you did a, good, you did a great job of illustrating the stories. I, I really, really like that part. So autonomy is pretty obvious. People either have their autonomy or they don't, and they know. Even though in a lot of places they're told, oh, you're free to do anything except this and that and that and that. And except the list is longer than than the things you can do. Uh, and you have to remember and all that. Um, what you call managerial evolution, when I first saw it, I thought, no, because my own, um, my own experience, it was a break. It was a, it was a total break. It was, in, in, in our case, it was the, the privilege of starting a new company and you have to experiment. Yeah. There's no other choice but to experiment. But we, by the time we started the experiment, we were ready. I was, I had to do the break. Roberto, my partner is a much younger guy. He was just younger, but we started from a, a very different route. So evolution, I thought, no, it's not evolution because if I, if I weren't to go from left to right, I don't think I would have gotten there. 
Uh, it, it was like left to right, left to right, left to right, break, and then the new thinking. The deficiency gratification, I, I really like that term. It struck me that's where, where a lot of it over crosses Maslow, right? The first, yeah. second levels mm -hmm. of Maslow. And, and the candy generally, I love gener um, vulnerability. I love because I thought kids, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what kids are like. And people say, oh, they're so cute. Wait until they grow up. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, of course, when they grow up, they, they learn to be dominant and, and dominate other people and stuff like that. So um, at this point, I think I'll stop talking. I'll open it up to the group. We'll have a 15 minute back and forth um, Q&A and, um, and we'll go from there. So if you want, guys, you can open your, your uh, things now. And I see Jose. Why don't we start with you, Jose? Yeah, well, one of the questions, this is, this is Society 2045 Friday Talks and, and we typically try to um, take the focus off of you and what you're doing and more into where you think we're going. Oh, I um, forgot. <laughs> and so, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do Matt's job and uh, <laughs> ask you the question of um, what. Uh, now, so you've done a lot of research, and and I suspect what you based on what you described that the reason you did this research was because you wanted to figure out how do we get back to the thing that I had <laughs> that yeah. we lost. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and if we're uh, I myself am, am an entrepreneur and I've been around startups long enough that I know those first few years are really hard, but they're also the best. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you've described is this kind of here's the recipe for getting to that place. But we're really more focused on what's that place look like? What happens if every enterprise was being guided by these radical imperatives? So what, what's your view of what could happen if everybody were to be in this space and being uh, running their organizations from this uh, radical imperatives? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, yeah, no, I love this question. And I sort of end the book with um, this question, actually. You know, the, there's research that I point to in the book that shows how the number of organizations doing this around the world, in some sense, now there's a spectrum of organizations that I could call radically collaborative. Um, uh, but that number um, in this research anyways, recently doubled from like 3% to 8% of organizations around the world. And I, I think that's not going to slow down. Uh, and the reason is because, you know, these, these organizations are operating in highly competitive environments, but they're also being highly competitive. And they're proving that partnership and equality are in many ways much more competitive than domination and coercion. Um, and so they're having this fabulous success. It's the reason why hire went from, you know, the struggling, bumbling, you know, bureaucratic nightmare to this really powerful sort of incubation you know, factory for startups in some sense than it is today, right? And why that's proven to be so competitive. So I think, I think there's reason to believe that this will continue to grow. What does it look like when we get there? Um, all right, well, there's, there's, I think, a couple of things to consider. It's, it's a world in which meaning and fulfillment in your daily life isn't, is, is not only just a dream, not a, it's, it's no longer just something you might dream about, but it's something you could experience right, on a daily basis. Uh, I think that's ultimately what these organizations are creating. They're creating environments in which people are feeling safe, secure, autonomous. They have a sense of fairness and esteem and trust and respect, and they become capable of doing the things that they wanna do in their lives and even just discovering what those things even are. 
I think that's the beauty of what I see in so much of these organizations. And that's certainly the beauty that I felt early on in my time at Pivotal Labs and uh, what I hope everyone can experience. Uh, so I think that's part of what I see a potential future. Now, the other interesting thing about it and uh, is what happens to people over time when they're immersed within these very psychologically healthy environments um, in which they experience high degrees of deficiency gratification and experience high degrees of collective innovation through you know, model two productive reasoning or candid vulnerability. What happens to the human being over time as they're immersed within it? Now that's a really interesting phenomenon too because the reality is they change in very dramatic ways. The more and more you derive a sense of security and autonomy and all these other higher level needs from your surrounding environment, the less and less you need them. And the more and more you become motivated by very different sorts of things by very, very different sorts of qualities, right? You're no longer drawn to things based on how much security, autonomy, fairness, esteem, trust, belongingness, et cetera, that they give you. You become motivated by things like simplicity, beauty, completeness, finality, uh, cessation, all these kind of other values that you're not going to get from the people around you anymore. So you're no longer sort of dependent on the environment. You become much more independent of your psychological environment around you. Um, you develop a much more democratic character structure over time. And these are just sort of clinically observed characteristics of people that are immersed in environments like this for a long time. So I think the other thing that's going to happen though is we're going to begin to experience very different sorts of behaviors and even just sociality within, within groups, within organizations, within nations um, over time as more and more people become immersed in these environments. And I think that's going to lead to ways that, to, to things that I can't begin to predict, right? It's, it's, it's hard enough for me to imagine <laughs> how those people think and operate and behave and what they're motivated by, just even one of them. But when we begin to develop whole like groups and societies full of people like this, I, I have no idea where that's going to lead us. And that's sort of how I end the book too. I sort of say, I don't, I, I'm really excited to take this journey. And I really have no idea ultimately where it's going to lead us. My only hope is that it leads us to just new heights and farther reaches of what it means to be a human being. So, you know, those are some of my first thoughts. I was gonna say, Marcel, if, uh, si tienes alguna pregunta, me dices, y yo se la pregunto, okay? And, uh, oh, okay, uh, Stuart. And by the way, Stuart is, is a big fan of asking the who's going to take the garbage out question. So <laughs> I'm not going to do that today, Matt. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, first thing I want to do is is kudos, Matt, for for digging in and and it sounds like you did you know some amazing extraordinary uh, research, and it sounds to me like these places are. Um, what I'd call a culture of community, mm -hmm. culture of community. And in, in, in the, I do have a question. In the book, uh, True North, um, it was identified that people who are part of a, some kind of a quasi spiritual group, which this almost is, mm -hmm. that they have that kind of openness, that their lives are just much richer for it. So um, what do you think about the idea, um, you know, as we look to the future, uh, of you becoming an evangelist, a real evangelist for getting more and more organizations to operate uh, in, this, in this fashion, especially, I, I assume that the companies are financially successful, wh whatever that means in the traditional sense, but also providing all these other uh, kind of societal benefits through, that, through the individuals that are operating in, in the group. Yeah. I, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are, are you saying, what, what, what do you mean when you say evangelist? Oh, that you're going to really hit the ground running, not just to sell books, yeah. but, but in some ways, just, you know, a real deep belief that, hey, you know, we got to create the future in, in this way. Otherwise, you know, we're going to just, <laughs> I'll use the term devolve because you used it. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I see. Well, um, I, yeah, I didn't write this to make money. 
I'll start with that. And I don't know if I'll make any money off of this book, but I did write it because I believe very much that the world that we have is the world that we have made. There's nothing about it that was necessary, that the challenges and pain that we may face today in our world is by choice and that we can make a different choice. And this book is sort of my attempt to understand how different things could be and what is necessary to get there. And recently I just started a, um, a, 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 an online community for people that are discovering this book and want to find other people to talk about it. My hope is that things like that I can help cultivate and nurture so that we end up with sort of a worldwide community of people um, that are attempting to uh, achieve these sort of new ways of being uh, collaborative and being together as a community and as a group and as an organization, you know, all over the world and be able to share stories, success, failure, um, uh, and uh, just support each other as well through a journey that, you know, will be, you know, decades in the making. Um, I don't, I don't know what my ultimate role in all of that will be if, even if that, you know, came to fruition as I imagine it, but I'm excited to figure it out. I'll just say that. Great. Um, yeah, we can do this offline, but um, I love the idea of getting getting this book into the hands of a number of people who've got big followings and are very, very in, influential. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, by the way, for all of you. Um, uh, okay. Thanks again for inviting me to this. I'm curious how you came up with the year 2045. So uh, your third generation um programmer right yeah which is that means your parents had babies really quickly um <laughs> and um <laughs> and so you you probably grew up watching uh star trek right <clears throat> absolutely absolutely and uh so <clears throat> the enterprise was launched in 2445 oh um yeah and uh, Jose wanted 2030, and I said, no, 2445. So we, we uh, agreed on 2045 as one generation. At the, at the time, it was 25 years out. Yeah. And um, that's, where, that's where the date comes from. Oh, I get it. OK, awesome. Very cool. I don't know if it was clear from, from the intro that uh, a big part of our purpose is to bring communities together. Yeah. So we, we know we, we don't have the answer. We have a piece of it. Yeah. Um, but if we put them all together and they start talking to each other, it's more likely that we'll come up with a better solution for the world towards 2045. Yeah. Um, if we have that long. <laughs> yeah. If we if we have that long, that's a good point. Uh, Marcel has a question. Marcel, you're mute. Sí, eh, primero nada más me gustaría si me puedes aclarar un poco más esto de, de deficiency gratification. ¿Cuál es el sentido? Oh, well, can you clarify uh, deficiency gratification? What's the what's the thinking behind that? Does that work? Yeah. Just explain a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, well, um, you're all probably familiar with deficiency motivation. I'm sure you've all heard of things like scurvy, right? That comes from a vitamin C deficiency. If you don't have enough vitamin C, you start to get sick. Well, what's the cure for scurvy? Vitamin C. <laughs> it's eating vitamin, you know, eating stuff with vitamin C, taking pills with vitamin C, and the symptoms begin to dissipate. All right, so this, this phenomenon of physical deficiency um, sickness um, has been known for you know hundreds of years, right? That it's it's become more and more well understood over time, obviously. But hundreds of years ago, we understood that there are certain things the human body needs: salt, vitamin C, etc. And if you don't get it, you're going to get sick in some pretty interesting ways. And and if you go long enough, you could even die. But the cure is simply to um, gratify the deficiency. Okay, so in the 20th century, a very similar thing was discovered. Uh, for psychological needs, right? Humans 
we are animals, right? And we have a lot of physiological needs just like other animals. But it turns out we have developed all sorts of psychological needs, which seem to persist across cultures, across ethnicities, around nations all over the world. We all seem to be born with certain needs for things like safety and security and fairness and esteem and trust and love. You can't live without love, right? And they actually, these needs work in, in, on us and on our bodies and on our minds in much the same way that physiological deficiencies work. If you are deprived of love, if you're deprived of safety and security and autonomy and fairness, you will begin to exhibit a sickness and wither psychologically, physically, behaviorally. You will develop a neurosis uh, and, and sort of, it's, they're, they're all what they call psychopathological, right? They, lead to a sickness of the mind. And it, they can also obviously lead to a sickness of the body too. Okay, so the cure for them is to gratify the deficiencies. If you are deprived of love and you begin to get sick in certain ways, mentally and physically, the cure is to feel love, to be loved by others. And it's the same for these other higher level psychological needs as well. Deficiency gratification is simply a shortened version of deficiency need gratification. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it's sort of, meant to describe both the process by which um, we can uh, help each other live full and meaningful lives. Um, but it, but it, it also points to the fact that so many of us show up um, every day, you know, in our work lives and in our family lives deficient. We often, I think many people around the world, and certainly I think this is true here in America, are showing up every day deficient in some or another psychological need and we're hurting because of it. Um, so then these environments that I've discovered in these organizations, what's very clear in, in so many of them is to what extent people don't suffer from these deficiencies within the organization and to what extent they just repeatedly and systematically and structurally through a number of practices gratify each other's deficiency needs, create high trust environments, create environments where you feel safe and secure and autonomous where you don't feel disadvantaged by others. You don't feel like some boss is walking around waiting to pull the rug out from under you, right? These are environments in which people feel really safe to take risks, um, uh, to innovate, to be creative, and to do pretty amazing things. And to fail too, they feel so safe to fail because they know the people around them, trust them, understand that sometimes we fail and they're there to support them if they fail. So that, anyways, I know that's a, a lot, but that, hopefully that explains a bit more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, it, by it, the way, in my, in my experience, that's all very true. The, the more, the safer people feel, the more risk they take. And some of it we've been calling innovations. And um, so when I hear people now, you know, companies in particular talking about where the kings and queens of innovation and, and, and stupid statements like that. And, and then they want everybody to come back to the office because it's Tuesday. Um, and um, it was, I just posted a uh, address for a uh, video of Sapolsky, uh, a Stanford uh, researcher, talk, talking about depression. And a big part of it is, is lack of control, mm. learning, learning to be helpless. Mm. Very helplessness. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you know that you know that. Mm -hmm. that. So, any other questions? Where? Come. Could I could I say something? So I I'd like to go back to Jose's question about twenty forty five. So there is the optimistic side of me that answered Jose's question in the beginning, and I'd like to share with you the pessimist pessimist pessimistic side. Um, Yeah, I, I think Stuart earlier said we may not get there. I have that fear too. We may not get there, you know, or if we do, it, it may be too late because we are destroying the earth. We are destroying the environment. I mean, every day species are going extinct, right? And we see sort of the world um, and the climate around the world doing all kinds of crazy and scary things, right? Like the the current that takes heat from the tropics up to Great Britain is flickering now, right? If that goes out, Great Britain will have the environment of Siberia 
right? We saw the heat dome over the Pacific Northwest, right? And so events like that are warning signs. Why is all of this happening? Obviously, we're all sort of um, a part of why this is happening because it's, it's civilization. These machines that we're using right now to communicate are created through the destruction of the environment. This house I'm sitting in is created through the destruction environment. My yard is, is you know, an example of just clear cutting an environment and an ecosystem and creating just a monocrop on it of grass, right? Like everywhere we turn, we're, you can see the way that humans live today is a way that is based on the consumption and ultimately the destruction of the habitat that we live in. And so that's my fear that That's not going to change because somebody makes a law that says, oh, we got to pollute less or we got to, you know, be carbon neutral by this date, right? We are part of this just runaway train plunging towards the cliff, right? Or the, whatever it is. And I don't, I don't know if we'll stop it. I think that's a common fear. Uh, it's what Stuart said, if we make it or if we survive or something, um, that is our common fear, that we won't make it 2045. Or I think humanity will persist, uh, that you human beings will persist, but our culture cannot, our civilization cannot. Kelly Jackson asked a question, I don't know if she's still with us or what, uh, have, you, have you done research on how non-deficient people show up in their family life and their communities? Um, if you looked into that, well, how does it spread out of the workplace? Um, yeah, not in a specific sense, like what it, what it, what people that have been immersed for a long time in a deficiency gratifying environment and become, begin to experience what, you know, Maslow and positive psychologists refer to as being motivation. How does it change the nature of their family relationships and community relationships? I don't, I don't have a good um, sense of, yeah. I mean, I, I understand, you know, I, in, in the research that I did, I, I understood a little bit about what makes up their motivational character, but um, beyond like, you know, some anecdotes that I read, I don't, I don't think I have a very good handle on what Kelly's looking for in it. I'm sorry, I wish I did, because great question. Maybe I can follow up on Kelly. You yourself during those ten years with Pivotal Labs, um, how did how did it affect you and your family? So maybe not research, but what what how did it affect your life during that time? Yeah, you know the very um, the very first thing that I experienced when I came to Pivotal Labs. I was coming from a, a financial enterprise, right? And when they invited me to come interview with them, I had heard of them. I had used their product management software called Pivotal Tracker, but I didn't really know anything about them. And I walked into the floor of their office there in New York and, and it was so loud and people were happy. There were so many people talking at once. Everyone was pairing on these pairing workstations. They didn't even know I was there. I was just like, there was nobody at the front desk. I just started walking around. And everything was just sort of overwhelming. And then I realized there was something else that was odd about this. I was almost uncanny, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then I did, and I realized they were all smiling. Like everybody was like happy. And I had spent long enough in a um, growth inhibiting environment uh, in which I felt very psychologically deficient that the experience of just seeing people having joy at work, that was uncanny to me. And so that was my first sort of experiences there um, was being immersed in an environment in which I suddenly felt happy to be at my job, to learn from all the people around me. I was also a little terrified because I'd already been programming for, at that point, like 15 years. And my first pair was somebody that had been only doing it for like three years and he programmed circles around me. I'd never been in an extreme programming environment. I had never seen how quickly you can learn and level up as an engineer at skills by being immersed in, uh, immersed in that environment. So there was also a bit of imposter syndrome, but being around people who care about you, who make you feel safe, 
to try things and fail helped me get over it pretty quickly. That was a really transformative experience. And absolutely, that is, you said it earlier, Jose, like, you know, trying to get that back is part of what led me to write this book. And it absolutely is because over the years, right, Pivotal was spun out, Pivotal Labs was spun out, became part of this much bigger company that was a conglomeration of many other companies uh, that became called Pivotal. Um, and my own experience there uh, was scaling a rapidly growing dominator hierarchy. When I joined, there were two levels within the company. When I left, there were like 20 levels within the company, right? And I had made my way halfway up to become global head of engineering for Pivotal Labs, but it was a miserable experience. I didn't enjoy anything about that. I miss being on teams. I miss that the most of anything. That was such a powerful experience. Um, so yeah. I've got I've got a follow up question to that, Matt, and 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 the question is I was going to ask generally about scalability of these organizations, but the last anecdote you told really is kind of telling. Any of the organizations that you came across um, that stayed independent, what was their scalability like? Yeah, yeah. So um, well, the largest. Uh, organization that I profile in my book that has a radically collaborative organizational structure is Hire. Uh, Hire is 80,000 people, and they went from being, um, you know, I think, well, they went from being a really crappy manufacturer of refrigerators in the 80s, making lots of different, you know, good refrigerators in the 90s through like, but also scaling and growing with like matrix management and stuff like that. And they eventually just over time pioneered a new way of working where they discarded all of the sort of models that they had tried to copy from all these Western companies and said, you know, none of that works. Their CEO was inspired by um, the Chinese philosophy text I Ching. And there it talks about the highest level of human governance being a host of dragons without a leader. And he was inspired to create a company that could be something like that. And so that's what he calls this micro enterprise culture that they've evolved, right? Where Everybody can be an entrepreneur. Everybody can start a micro enterprise. Um, and they're free as micro enterprises to relate to each other as they please, to contract with each other as they please, or to go outside the company. He says they start their own pr uh, products on the market as these micro enterprises without the guidance of a leader. And that's what he calls the highest level of human governance, right? So I think it's, it's not only possible for it to scale, but actually he points to it. And uh, you know, I think a lot of analysts like Gary Hamill and, um, uh, others point to this structure as what has enabled their, you know, growth and and now dominance over the last ten years. Right, they're the number one appliance manufacturer in the world now. Um, so I think it's possible for something like this to grow rapidly. And you know, and when I look at their structure specifically, it at first I was like, wow, that's amazing. How could that really work? And then uh, later I started to think, how could it not work? Right, because in some ways, what they have done is to create an environment internal inside their company that looks a lot like a free market economy, um, which for better or worse, has proven to scale right across the world in which you have all these independent agents in a free market interacting with each other, working with each other or competing with each other as they please. And there's nobody sitting at the top of a free market economy dictating to everyone what they have to do. Well, I think Hire looked at something like that and said, you know what, that works so well at a macro scale. Why not do that inside the company, right? If it works out there, could it work in here? And so that's why they're doing it. And that's why Zappos has moved beyond holacracy to what they call market-based dynamics, which in many ways look a lot like micro enterprises at Hire. Right? I think what they're discovering is that sense of autonomy um, and free agency and sort of freedom in the workplace, to use a near soft term, is actually incredibly scalable. Um, and also deficiency gratifying at the same time. Great, thank you. I remember coming back from Esalen, you know, there's this issue of you, know, you go back and nobody in your family is, is into it. But if you take your time and you actually bring it to the family the way they brought it to the workplace, mm. you transform the family. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from from my own experience, what I've seen happen in Mexico is that people abandon their dominating way of being, which is, and I, I've raised my kids that way. The, you know, the best thing for you is to be a, a dominant 
a-hole like the rest of us and there you go and once you abandon that um kids pick up on that stuff light and fast and um it, it does spread out and the next thing that i'm looking out for is school systems and, and see how that works there's a lot of activity um around politics politics in mexico was uh you know, people didn't care about it because they had no control over it. For 70 years, they were ruled by the dictatorship, oligarchy, I should say. And um, little by little, they've been learning it. But again, this wasn't an evolution. It wasn't the, my generation evolving into a new generation. No, it was, it was the children, grandchildren that are, that are making that happening. And um, for, for these young guys, you know, existing in living, making their living out of a, out of a place like uh, Nearsoft was a good experience and that it taught them a lot of it has to do with communication and being able to talk and, and listen and stuff like that and not be, feel personally offended, but take it as a, as a gift when somebody gives you feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, once you start adopting those practices, it's hard to not use them at home, and eventually the school system, and eventually politics, and eventually the world. But uh, we're not there yet. We're, we're, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take their their kids to do it better. Matt is, uh, I think you're the youngest author in this crowd, written a book, a good book. I, re I recommend it. It's coming out in February, you said? Yeah. Okay, and then it's going to be what, in Amazon? uh bars and all and stuff like that yeah yeah totally <laughs> everywhere books are sold yeah even everywhere. Airports. <laughs> yeah. books are sold yeah just a just a, a a comment matt it sounds like that what was revealed is similar to in the uh in the 1980s i studied a body of work and was partnered with a woman who developed this body of work around something called best work and best work isn't, you know, you getting good at your job. Best work is, is what you naturally do because of the human being you are. Mm. And it really bumps up, you know, the energy. Uh, and it sounds like that these organizations create that environment where individuals can just flower as, 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 as human beings. Yeah. I mean, financial success follows from that, that the, the exit that we had, was repeatedly the, the guy who led the, the acquisition said, oh, yeah, there was this energy. And I felt that. And, and we said things like, oh, because they own the place. And um, that didn't make sense until later on. But they, they bought on the basis of the energy that they saw and they didn't have. Mm -hmm. It's the juice. It's the juice. Yeah. <laughs> Call it love. Be. People fall in love with each other and it just bumps the whole place up. Yeah, absolutely. So it does, it does scale. And uh, hiring became a lot easier over time. And um, just uh, one thing mounts into the other. So. Entiendo que estos cuatro atributos es una nueva manera de ver a la gente. Es una manera radicalmente nueva de ver a la gente en la organización. So, mi pre it, mi right. pregunta es, eh, ¿se puede ser, eh, puede ser una compañía radical, ¿no? una colaboración radical dentro, en un entorno brutalmente competitivo? <laughs> okay, so he says, so th this four principles, or uh, imperatives, as you call them, um, <clears throat> are at the basis of all these, all these companies. Um, so can you be a radical enterprise in an environment where, it's, where that is, is brutally competitive as opposed to collaborative? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the the answer is yes, and the existence is in companies, for instance, like Morningstar. What a cutthroat industry tomato processing is, right? What a brutally like the margins are so thin, 
right? And, and they scaled a radically collaborative organizational structure from nothing to being the number one tomato processor in the world. And, you know, in less than 30 years, they only started in 1990. Um, so yes, I, I think it is possible to be highly competitive uh, as a radically collaborative organization. You know, W.L. Gore, right, is sort of one of the longest lived experiments in radical collaboration. They went from, you know, uh, W.L. Gore and like three or four other people, chemists in a basement in Delaware to 11,000 people around the globe. And they still practice autonomy of allocation and they still have no managers and they still have peers setting salaries of other peers, right? Peer-based salary, you know, compensation and stuff like that. So I think it is possible and, and certainly they work in a, a very competitive environment. But I yeah. think you meant the competitive inside the company, which is the same sense I get from higher. Oh, I see what you mean. <clears throat> yeah, you know what? Um, okay, so I, I think that's a good question too, right? To what extent are these organizations internally um, collaborative versus competitive? And is that a false dichotomy? You know, I think one, one thing I can point to from the higher experience is that they discovered that um, it couldn't just be that uh, micro enterprises internally could contract with each other um, however they wanted because they would end up uh, hurting each other, right? One micro enterprise would try to contract with another one and they would set prices that ultimately wouldn't help anyone in the long run. And so what they did was they said, okay, we have two types of micro enterprises. One is external and one is internal. One is creating a consumer facing product that is actually being sold and developed with users right out there in the world. The other is an internal micro enterprise that is doing things that these other external micro enterprises want, services that they wanna consume. Um, with the, the, the one like in a nutshell, the change they made was they said an internal micro enterprises profit, right? Like the actual like pay that you get if you're inside an internal micro enterprise is dependent on how much money those external micro enterprises make, how much profit they make, right? And so you're not just trying to make money off the external micro enterprise. You now have a vested interest in seeing their products succeed on the market. Um, after they made that change, they were able to scale it dramatically, right? To go from like, you know, 1,000 to now uh, something like 7,000 micro enterprises inside their company. Um, uh, and 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 they they stop seeing those sort of um, dysfunctional behaviors between micro enterprises in which one would ultimately undercut another. Um, so yeah, I think it's possible. I I would say that's still a very competitive environment, but um, yeah, it, it seems like they've figured out how to make sure that ultimately collaboration is happening between these two sort of fundamental types of you know enterprises within their organization. And and. To uh, Marcel's question, um, I think the future is more smaller companies collaborating with each other um, and being more successful that way. So when we when may start as brutal competition, you know, I will colonize your market and push you out and stuff like that, um, which bacteria are, are known for, right? They colonize places and they kill the other bacteria and stuff like that. But they also collaborate with not just with their peers or their clones or whatever, uh, but with other bacteria that can be beneficial to them. Uh, in our case, we're an example of, you know, they did pretty well. Uh, collaboration worked and scaled faster than competition. Mm -hmm. If our liver were comp was competing with our pancreas, that's, that's your dad. So, um, so yeah, collaboration work is just that we've grown up in the environment of, of competition because of scarcity, which stopped is being a scarcity, you know, hundred years ago, but we didn't notice. And, um, and, and, and what we're trying to do is, is get the world to notice that, Hey, look, there's a lot of abundance. Let's change our ways and taking stuff out of the the depth of the earth to take the carbon and throw it up in the air is not a good idea. Any other comments or uh, questions or goodbye kisses or anything? I, I just uh, want to thank Matt because that this was pretty awesome. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for bringing uh, all of these great ideas. I mean, they're very consistent with the, the work that we're all doing, but uh, more voices, more diverse voices, I think uh, is, is wonderful. So thank you for doing a lot of work, obviously. 
Thank, thank you. And this has been awesome. And yeah, I um, I hope I get to stay in touch with all of you. I mean, it's, it's yeah, I want to hear more from all of you and all the stuff you're doing. We'll, we'll continue the, the conversation. We're going to work together. Yeah, that, well, I mean, like you said, more, more than the help, we're starting to see uh, instances of that. But I'd like to see it go faster. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hasta luego.